We have been in a series called Awe and Wonder. And I'm going to invite Petra to join me as we get going today. Uh, we have, each week, we have shared the Christmas story from a child's voice, from a child's perspective, and we're going to continue that theme. And this is Petra Knutson, and uh, she's going to read from Luke chapter 2. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah of the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby, lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought of, of, about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angels had told them. I love it. Thank you, Petra. Awesome. Yes. You can have a seat. Awesome. It was just like the angel had said. And that's the Christmas story, a portion of it. And I love Christmas. We love Christmas here at the Gateway Church. And it's interesting that that story that we've been reading over the last couple of weeks and what Petra just read has been contested in, in many places. It's been forgotten and it's been minimized. Our culture uh, is slipping when it comes to the truth of the Christmas story. And we're not talking about Jesus, even at Christmas. Uh, we can tolerate that and handle that within our culture. And we've got to rub shoulders with people that will minimize the Christmas story, but the facts of the virgin birth, of these angel visits that we just read about, when they get washed out or jaded, we must stand up, and whether that's at work or in our families, and to share the good news, the greatest story that was ever told. Church, we cannot allow the church to stop sharing the awe and the wonder of the Christmas story. Can I get an Amen. Amen. When it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, that this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born, we believe exactly that, that this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. And because of that, we need to put that in our heart. We need to believe it. We need to share it. And we need to let that story change us. And even this morning, and whether you're online or whether you're here in person, we believe that the power of the story will make a difference. Amen. Well, we've defined awe as this, that when you experience something bigger than yourself, uh, it, and I love the, the uh, definition of the senses are the sense of wonder we feel in the presence of something vast that transcends our understanding of the world. It transcends our reality. It's the senses that we were created with, our emotion. We were emotionally and physically created to, to feel these things. And, and when we ex experience something greater than what reality is, it, we often will use the word awesome. Everyone say the word awesome, right? But I was challenged back when I was a student in uh, high school. I remember uh, that I was told that there are, uh, are only two things in this world that are awesome, that the word awesome is often overused. And I was reminded of that as I was studying. And those two things that are really awesome is God himself 
And secondly, the work he does. And beyond that, there's really nothing awesome. It, because if something is humanly possible, it's not awesome. And when we talk about awe and wonder, and we talk about the word awesome in this series, what we have been talking about and what we've been getting to is are the miracles that God does in our lives. We believe in miracles here at the Gateway Church. And miracle is a term that gets thrown, a while, thrown around quite a bit, right? And uh, you say, oh, it's a miracle that the Lions beat the Vikings a couple weeks ago. How many Lions fans in the house? Maybe a few, all right? Not, not so many. Sorry, sorry, world. Um, maybe second service will do a little better. Or you say, it's a miracle that our baby slept through the night, right? And maybe that is a real miracle. I don't know. But miracles actually are only related to the things that are impossible, And right in the middle of this Christmas story, there is a pronouncement from an angel in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It's been our uh, anchor verse for this uh, series. It says in Luke 1, 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible if it's connected to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the truth is, God always shows up with miracles. Uh, Last week, Pastor Rocky uh, shared in our series, and he talked about creation, uh, how it's probably the greatest miracle of all, creating from nothing everything you see. It's a miracle. And then right anchored in the middle of Scripture is the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus. And then the future miracle is that Jesus is coming back, and it's to come, but the rapture of the church, we believe in that, and that will be a miracle in itself. And the fact is, is that the Christmas story is filled with real miracles, real awe and wonder. And we want to talk about these things in our families, in our workplaces. Then Mary and Joseph, they both had angel visits. Then we talk about the incarnation where Jesus was fully God and fully man wrapped up in the Christmas story. The virgin birth, of course, the stars in the sky, the visit from the Magi, which we're going to talk about next week. And even little, even after the actual birth of Jesus, the pronouncement of Simeon the prophet and Anna the prophetess, both, it says in scripture, were filled with awe. It's incredible, the story. And then even how God protected through divine intervention, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they kept Jesus alive and safe after the fact when, uh, when the government was trying to kill babies and, and uh, it was interesting. And of course, what Petra read this morning, that the angel appeared to the shepherds in the field and not only one angel, but then a host of angels. It says the armies of heaven presented themselves to the lowest of low in the society. They came to shepherds. And it's that story that I want to hone in on this morning. And there are three highlights, three points of the shepherds and the angels that we want to wrestle with this morning. The first point is this, that the shepherds received a word from the Lord. Let's look at it in verses uh, 8 through 12. Uh, uh, Petra read it, but in verse 11 it says, this is the pronouncement, this is the word from the Lord. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. The word was given, and then it was magnified with this heavenly host. This story for the shepherds in particular was a moment that was awesome. It was full of awe and wonder. But, you know, these stories of awe and wonder are not just found in Scripture. They can be found in our everyday life as well. And as I was studying and preparing, my heart was drawn to a story of my family and really related to my daughter, Reagan. Uh, When she was in her last year of high school, we started looking at options for her to go to college. It was important to us that she would do that. And we did some college visits, and we went to Grand Rapids, and we we decided we wanted to make the pilgrimage to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota to go visit North Central Uh, uh, university. But in that, we understood that that was a very expensive university about, oh, well, it was over uh, $30,000 a year when you put it all together. 
And uh, we knew it was kind of a long shot because in our family, we had decided that we were going to live debt-free and we wanted to put our kids through school debt-free, Lord willing. And uh, so we made this pilgrimage. It was just me and Reagan. It was kind of a long shot. It was kind of a a fun little journey, but really, was it going to happen? Were we going to make it happen? But in this journey, we met a young lady. Her name was Maddie. And she was Reagan's host for the weekend, for the couple days that we were there. And Maddie was from Texas, and she was a pastor's kid, so related to Reagan in that sense. And she just so happened to be going through school, and her story was that she was going through debt-free as well. Someone in her church uh, that where her, pa- her dad pastored was paying for her tuition uh, in full is what I remember, not in full. Uh, I, we won't get all the details, but it was, she was on a debt-free path and something was like, like that. I should have um, fast, fact-checked the story, but Reagan's here to do it. But over and over in the process, what I want to re- uh, remember, and I do remember this, is that Maddie... Her phrase in her Texan accent, and I'm going to butcher it, but she, she would say over and over, won't he do it? Won't he do it? And like we'd be talking about something and it might have seemed impossible or kind of out of the realm of, uh, of reality, and, and she would just say, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Come on, let's say it with a Texas accent, everybody. Won't he do it? Come on, just say it. That's right. If you're online, just type it in the, in the chat. Won't he do it, right? And uh, that's what we, we walked away. We had our own Holy Spirit revelation through this young lady. She was kind of our own angel visit. Now, we'll pause in that story and go back to the shepherds. What was the shepherds' response to the word of the Lord? You read it. Petra read it. They were terrified. They were full of fear and doubt. If you wrap it up, their response, there was a lack of faith in that moment. It was no thrill of hope type of situation. And it makes me think of our own interactions with the Lord, right? When we maybe hear a word from the Lord or maybe we're in a season of need and there's, there's issues that we're facing and all of a sudden the things we're believing for, the prayer request, sometimes there's a lack of faith. There might be doubt or fear, and there might be unanswered prayers in our life. Maybe we've prayed for this or that, and all of a sudden, this or that doesn't happen the way we prayed for it. And with impossible situations, whether it's your health situation or your finances or relationships, we just expect the impossible to be impossible. I know I've been there. And maybe you've been there too. Or maybe we put our hope in science and uh, we get deluded with science and technology and we say, well, that's not humanly possible or that's, that goes against what science would say. And unfortunately, whatever the case might be, many of us get skeptical or cynical in regards to the miracles of God. It's a lack of faith that puts us in a place where we've stopped believing in miracles, stopped asking for the impossible. And again, it might be because the government has stepped in and taken care of things. And you're thinking, okay, well, they've got this. It's not really a miracle because it's not God, right? Well, or maybe you think, well, maybe someone else, a, a, a person has stepped in and made the difference. Or maybe you say, well, it's the economy around me. Well, Or maybe even you've seen some abuse of miracles. And I was thinking that back when I was studying at Evangel University, we studied a certain evangelist. His name was Peter Papa, And uh, and he would uh, sell miracle water. And I heard about this in college. And I was the guy that went on and I found out how you could order some miracle water. And I did. For $7.77, I had them send me 
an envelope with miracle water. And I kept it in my desk for a long time, Pastor Sean, and uh, it was pretty awesome. It was just a little vial of water, and it ended up evaporating. And, uh, and then I don't know where it is. I couldn't find it. I did look for it uh, briefly. And I think it's in with all my books that are in my basement. But anyway, but it you know, and so people will, will take things and abuse Scripture or manipulate or they'll fake it. And, uh, and so whatever the case might be, uh, whatever you've experienced and you're saying, well, there's all these reasons why we should not believe. And what happens, we dismiss the word of the Lord. And when we do that, we need to be reminded, just like Maddie said to Reagan and to me over and over, won't he do it? Come on, say it with me. Won't he do it? And for when Reagan, when we got that word from the Lord, uh, it, just like the shepherds, we had a choice from that point on. What were we going to do with the word from the Lord? And in the story, in Luke ch chapter 2, uh, verse 15 and 16, it's our second point, that shepherds, they moved into action. Look at it. Verse 15 says, When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village, and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was a baby lying in the manger. They had a test of faith. What were they going to do with the word of the Lord? Well, they took action. And the same thing happened in our family. We had to take some action. We took this word, won't he do it? And it put Reagan on a trajectory to go to North Central. She had to apply to get in. She had to apply for scholarships. She had to do some work study things. And the summer before she ended up, after she got accepted, she worked in uh, Holland or Zealand. I can't remember, at a mortgage company uh, for 40 hours a week all summer long. And on top of that, she cleaned the armory five or six days a week in Grand Haven, two to three hours a day. It was no joke. She got busy. She went into action. And the point is, is that we must partner in action with the word of the Lord. It's not, oh, we can't just get the word and do nothing. We have to put it into action. It's a partnership. God, I'll do my part. That's our perspective. I, but if you don't show up, God, it's not going to work. See how it works? It's a partnership. We throw ourselves at God's feet, right? And then his sovereignty takes over. We may not understand it all. Scripture says we look on this side of eternity through a dim glass, right? But we must trust and we put things in God's hands. And in the shepherds, they heard the pronouncement, the word of the Lord, and then they hurried to go see. And the question I have is, what were the shepherds basing their hope in? What, where was their faith rooted in? It was rooted in the word of the Lord from the angel. The miracle was right in front of them. And it's the same for us today. We put our faith in God's word. And that's where we find the awe and the wonder in our lives. See, if we take away the virgin birth or the miracles or the angel visits or the resurrection, we would be left with a power less God. A God of no power, Satan would love that. But why would anyone serve a powerless God? Well, the fact is, we do not serve a powerless God. In fact, it is God's character throughout history to do the impossible. And that's our key verse, the Luke 1, 37. It's this idea that it's in God's nature, it's his character to do miracles, to do the impossible over and over and over. And what is interesting is that all of us, at one point or another in our lives, we need and have needed and will need a miracle. And there's a few stories in the church that have emerged in this season where there was a desperate situation, a hardship, uh, a, a disconnect from the Lord, 
uh, uh, really impossible impossibilities. And we want to share a couple of those stories through Marcus and Gabrielle, uh, two stories. Let's, without further ado, let's go to their stories. My name is Gabrielle Cricky. Um, I like to be called Gabby sometimes. My name is Marcus Gooden. My story is really, it, it honestly feels like, like, a, like a BC AD kind of situation. It's been over 20 years, long over 20 years since I've been in church. BC, before Christ, quite literally, I was really much of the world. I had an incident with the church uh, when I was a kid. I really didn't know about it because I pushed it down so much. I went to college and, you know, fell into like that trap that every college kid kind of goes through and has to get through. I ended up going to the hospital for two weeks with like tubes and wires coming out of me. It caused me to, when I was in therapy, I had to talk about it, so it brought up a whole lot of anxiety and depression and stuff like that. I was just grasping at whatever I could find, so I would look for that connection in um, other people, and when I you know, realized that they were flawed humans just like me, it really um, left me like dejected and angry, um, not only at them, but at myself. I've been struggling with depression, anxiety, PTSD. So what that ended up feeling like was just like almost running on ice, right? You're not going anywhere, um, but you're, you're trying your hardest. It's a tough, tough situation to have to deal with. I've been dealing with it for many, many years. For me, that turned into, I was working like 70 hour work weeks. I was drinking, I was smoking. Um, I was uh, like high, probably 65% of the time, just out of sheer boredom. I was exercising a lot because I knew that like uh, exercise was a healthy person's thing to do. Um, but I wasn't eating either. So I was getting sick a lot and I developed eating disorder tendencies. I was going through some major depression one day uh, back in the summer and I was home by myself and it just like hit me real, real hard. It all kind of just was spiraling around me and I was in the middle of it trying to grasp at the right thing but it just felt out of reach. I just grabbed my knife and I went to go cut my wrist. What does it take for someone to, to come to Christ? What does it take for someone to make a drastic change in their life? And what is it going to take for someone like me to make a drastic change in their life? Hmm. What does it take for someone to find Jesus? Kind of a cliffhanger. We'll see the full uh, story here in a minute kind of left it in a hopeless sense because that's the way many of us walk through life. We're facing things that seem impossible. We're facing things that are troubling us, that are holding us back. And we want to share the good news of Scripture this morning. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. If you go back to the very first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, it, there's a question, is anything too hard for God? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is what? No. In Jeremiah chapter 32, it says, Ah, Lord, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth, uh, talking about the miracle of creation, by your great power and your outstretched arm. And then it says this, nothing is too hard for God. 
for you. In verse 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? That's God, our God, speaking that. And then in the New Testament, there's a great promise in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Now to him who is able to do far above or far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think according to the power at work, I've got that underlined, within us. It's that partnership. I want to read that again. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask or even think according to the power that's at work within us. It speaks to our expectation. It speaks to our need. It speaks to our unanswered prayers. It speaks to our future. And if we go back to the story of the shepherds, they got a word from the Lord. They took action. Well, the third thing they did, they gave God the credit. Look at it in Luke chapter 2. This is an important piece to our miracle. Look what it says. Verse 17. Verse 17 says this. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about the child. Verse 18. All who heard the, te- the shepherd's story or their testimony were astonished. Verse 20, the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. They gave glory to God. They put the, the, uh, the, the incredibleness all on display, and they said this was to God's credit. They didn't try to say, hey, we figured this out. We were the special ones. No, they just gave God the glory in the story. And that really is how it played out for us at our family. When Reagan was saying, all right, we're going to go on the way home, uh, driving back from Minneapolis, I had felt in my heart that I had heard from the Lord. But I wanted Reagan to have the same sense. And about halfway home, and uh, she can tell the story better than us. Maybe I should have had you share it. But anyway, um, but she, I remember her saying, Dad, I really think this is God's will. And it was confirmation. And she, I said, I think so too. And then we went to work, like I said. And then as time went on, she made it to the North Central. She worked while she was in school there. And she made her way through completely debt-free. She graduated last December with money in her bank account. And it's all the glory goes to God. That is a story that we will anchor our family of awe and wonder. There were moments where we said, I don't think this is possible. I remember uh, kind of towing the line, saying, no, uh, Reagan, if you get a loan, you will uh, walk away from our support. And, uh, and, and it, there were some moments that were tense, that were hard, but to God be the glory, the awe and wonder showed up in our family. And the point is, we, when we experience that, we need to be prepared to tell everyone what God has done. We get a word, we put it into action, and when God does the miracle, then we share, we give God the credit throughout the process. You know, I was thinking about it this week. I'm a watch guy, and um, I don't know if I've ever told you about my watch. I bought this watch last October uh, during the pandemic. It's a Seiko. Um, nothing. It's not a Rolex. Some of you, some of you are like, ooh. But um, um, this this watch is pretty special. It's a 65 anniversary uh, of the first dive watch that Seiko made, and it's kind of special to me. But what I was thinking is, uh, the watchmaker who made this watch, uh, they put it together, and it's a fine machine. If you open up the back and watch it run, it's it's quite stunning. Uh, there are. Uh, if I remember right, uh, over a hundred parts inside of this little watch that work together in unison. And what's neat is this watch does not have a battery. It works on motion, and I've worn this every single day since I bought it. Uh, and I take it off to work out, and that's the only time, and then I put it right back on. And, uh, and it is quite a marvel. But the watchmaker that put this together, he made it and then released it, And I was thinking, God is not like that at all. He made us. He doesn't just make us and then say, okay, you're off on your own. God is not like a watchmaker 
where he gets things going and then steps away. Instead, we serve a God who is hands-on every single moment of every day in our lives. And the truth of that is that we have the loving Father who is interceding for us. And God, he reacts to our prayers of faith. He did it in Scripture, and he does it today. He responds. It's part of his character that he doesn't change, right? But the character is that he is a miracle-working God, and he does it because he cares, even with Jesus. So he did so many miracles throughout the, the gospel story. And you might be asked the question, well, why did Jesus do so many miracles? Well, first of all, he did those miracles to prove he was who he said he was. And yes, that is true. But could it be that he did many of these miracles just because he cared for the people that were in front of him? I believe that. Because he cared. And because he cared, he stepped into Marcus's life and in Gabrielle's life as well. And we left the last video portion there with this cliffhanger question. What would it take for Jesus to do the impossible? And let's pick up in that story and get the rest of the story. What does it take for someone to, to come to Christ? What does it take for someone to make a drastic change in their life? And what is it going to take for someone like me to make a drastic change in their life? I just grabbed my knife and I went to go cut my wrist. I think God knew in that moment that for me, what it would take was to completely pull me out of my life altogether. Something grabbed my hand and pulled my hand away. It was like I was reevaluating my whole life. I dropped the knife and stuff and I started crying. I knew that, like in the back of my mind, I knew that he was there and he was right. But his way was so different from my way that it didn't seem feasible for me to go to him. I first met this church here at the end of year summer bash. Well, I got a counselor and... Everybody seemed really, really nice. And I talked to my fiance about coming to church and stuff and I was kind of reluctant on it, but some told me to just go, so... I came. And as the sessions went on, I realized, oh, this guy is a Christian. And like, he's, he, is, he knows that I grew up in a Christian mindset and I didn't tell him I wasn't a Christian. And so he's starting to use these like references. Coming to the Gateway Church, you know, Pastor Ben, Pastor Robbie, um, and everybody else here welcome me. If you don't feel valued, you need to start framing yourself in like a child of God kind of way. That was the pivotal moment. That was like the, the AD and O'Domini moment of cutting the world out of me, sitting me down, putting a mirror in front of me and saying, okay, let's get to work. I used to be a real mean person because of all the hardships that I went through closed off and stuff and so it got me to be more open and more caring about other people now and since I came here to Gateway Church I've met a lot of really really nice people. It was so it was just easy to be here um, and everyone was very kind and welcoming and they wanted to know more about me and I like felt like opening up and sharing with them. I am uh, an ex-con that has changed his life for 360 degrees. I knew moving here would have its challenges, but with God next to me and around me and in my life, it doesn't feel impossible. Nothing is impossible for God. He loves us all. That's like the synopsis of my story. That's it, it really is like the, the before and then the after. And all the moments in between were 
they were hard and they were like liberating and they were surprising and really just added to the total transformation of what once was to now what is. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Thanks, Marcus, for your courage to share. And Gabrielle, she'll be with us uh, second service. What would it take for God to do a miracle in your life? If we just take the story of the shepherds and the angels, uh, then the heavenly armies that appear to the shepherds, uh, we can look at that and see that God, number one, he gave a word. Then they took action, and then they gave glory to God. You know, there's a term that we often will use around Christmas time, and it's a shame that we don't use it more often. It's the term Emmanuel. And Emmanuel basically means God with us. And I have in my notes here, whatever you need equals Emmanuel. That is a strong promise. You say, well, I'm not sure God does financial miracles. Well, listen, you're sitting in a financial miracle, and uh, we don't have time to, to share about that, but it's absolutely true. You think about salvation. It's a miracle every time someone surrenders their life to Jesus. It's only by God's grace that it happens. Maybe you know of a marriage that's struggling, or maybe your marriage is struggling. I've got a friend in Indianapolis that uh, 15 years ago now, there was some infidelity in, in their life, and, and uh, it almost took their marriage out. Well, they are strong and uh, healthier today than ever. One of my best friends. It can happen. God can do miracles, and he can do the impossible in our lives because of the truth of Emmanuel. I want to speak to those of you that have prodigal sons and daughters. Don't stop believing. I read Luke 15 this week in my devotions, and uh, it's a story of the lost son, right? The one that goes and, and uh, spoils his, his uh, inheritance and then returns, and his father welcomes him home. Prodigal sons and daughters are coming home in Jesus' name. There might be situational miracles that are needed. Uh, Bob Boss, I love the story of your son in Chicagoland that sold his house but had to have another house uh, and that had to close in the timing. He's one of the um, political figures in, in the area. Uh, I can't remember what, what in Illinois, right? And, uh, and the, the, the miracle of situational houses selling, it was only by God's grace that that happened. And this morning, Brent and Ashley are online. I know many of you have been praying for them uh, through our connection with Amber Wilder. Ashley uh, had, had uh, uh, delivered a child and then immediately had COVID and was in the hospital for, uh, literally fighting for her life for six or seven weeks and now is home. God has done a miracle. It's incredible. And I share these things with the hope that whatever you stand in need of, there is Emmanuel, God with us. He's here. And I love to just go back to Reagan's story. Won't he do it? Let that be a word of faith 